I'm going to hand over to Dilith to maybe give a few opening remarks and then we'll open up into some questions and conversation with me. And then if you have something you want to raise as a question, please do feel free to put it in the chat and I'll keep an eye on that as we go. Um, so, um, uh, Dilith, over to you to say hello to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. And hopefully I'm not on mute. Um, and we can hear you. Uh, you can hear me OK. So, oh, gosh, what a lovely invitation, a uh, lovely chance to come and and uh, and chat to you all. Um, it's also helped me uh, to, to reflect just a little bit about um, what I was doing 30 years ago, actually, because it's when when I think back um, about the kind of origins of, of where and how I, I got involved um, in bringing national voices together. It was, um, I actually was um, the director of communications at the National Asthma Campaign. Um, at the time I was on the board of the Long-Term Medical Conditions Alliance, which was a kind of pre predecessor to, to national voices. And, and we came together from an asthma point of view with um, the, I think it was the Stroke Association at the time or epilepsy uh, charity, um, diabetes UK it was it wasn't that called that then but um we we came together as organizations interested in in long-term conditions uh in an NHS at a time when no one was interested in anything it was all about it was all about episodes of of care and so on and so um but then um then uh when um I moved to breakthrough breast cancer I was chief executive there um, we had uh, Alan Milburn. Obviously, we had the the um, the election of a, a Labour government, and Alan Milburn became the Secretary of State for Health, and he kicked off this incredible process, which brought about the the um, publication of the NHS plan. And it was it was quite an incredible time where they set up this NHS board, and they got uh, lots of kind of uh, voluntary sector organisations in and it felt like the first time actually that that the voluntary sector and patient advocacy organisations had actually had a seat at the table and um, you know we were sitting alongside uh, you know the BMA you know the Royal Colleges and it was the first time that there'd been a chance to to be at the top table like that and then as it as the kind of as it as it went on um they they then created the next iteration of the nhs board which was a much bigger um thing and and, and there was a new health secretary john reed uh, and it was much more like a, an assembly uh, but still it was very much kind of random which voluntary sector organizations or which patient advocacy groups were included in this um, assembly and it then became clear that it, we really needed to have a body an organization of some kind that could bring together all the different um, uh, voluntary sector uh, and patient organizations in a way that could um, kind of synergize key messages and really kind of help to make our contributions more punchy so we weren't contradicting each other we weren't uh, kind of, you know, competing with each other to say, and this, and this, and this, and this, um, and that we were, um, you know, we were making absolutely the best use of um, our seats at, at the table and that some of the groups that weren't, didn't have a seat at the table could get, could get their voices heard as well. And so that, that's really where the idea for for national voices came about and and you know and this is what you're doing now you know you you're you've made it real and and you know it's really it's so fabulous to see and so what what happened was i just started chairing a group of people who were on the the um the what was called the Nash, the nhs board it was not the same as what it is now but it was more like an nhs assembly type thing and then when I finished at Breakthrough Breast Cancer as chief executive there, because I was appointed to the House of Lords by Tony Blair, um, Jeremy Hughes, who was the who was appointed as my successor at Breakthrough, he then took over um, developing national voices. And and so I've always kind of you know seen that the that it formed into a charity and 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 now the organisation that 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 it is now is it, just you know it's in, incredibly. 
um yeah it's it's really good to see and then i think when i think back having you know, thinking about all the kind of challenges and the changes that have gone on i mean it, it does keep coming back to having a seat at the table for me uh, and um being able to present in a really strong um and and you know cohesive fashion the 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 views and the concerns and the 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 you know the aspirations of patients and and there it, it's just such a um a, you know an important piece of work to do and without um a body like national voices it just wouldn't happen so so that's kind of where where i'm coming from so just very quickly because so we can get into the conversation bit of it but so as um, when I um, went into House of Lords, I did serve as a, a minister for a few years. Mm. And then from 2010, I was booted out by the electorate, as uh, uh, as everyone will remember. So and then I thought, well, what am I going to do? I was far too young when I was introduced into the House of Lords. I still felt that I had a, a lot to to do. Um, and so I decided I wanted to go back into to the the breast cancer world. Uh, my sister had been diagnosed with with oh. breast cancer. She had um, uh, incurable breast cancer and is still with us, fighting away in her own way and doing really brilliantly. But um, so that that for me has been a really big inspiration for me just to 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 you know take that experience and and turn it into something more positive. And that became an opportunity because of the retirement of the chief executive of breast cancer campaign, which was another research charity. So I, I went there and then from there managed to bring breakthrough and breast cancer care through a, a, a two mergers together to create breast cancer now. And that's been, you know, it has been the kind of, <laughs> what can I say? It's been the, the endeavor of a lifetime to, to, to really uh, bring together the, the, the three, biggest charities in breast cancer and try and create this this single voice um and you know bring together all the support the peer support the information and services the the, the nursing and and all of that and the influencing and campaigning work with the research um, and that again that was quite inspired for me by um the my experience at the national asthma campaign or asthma uk as is now because there was an example of a charity that came together in the kind of late 80s early 90s bringing research patient voice uh, patient education all together into one charity and and it, the cross fertilization of ideas and patients having you know really really um a systematic input into the research agenda as well being so important so that's how I've ended up where I am now as the chief executive of, of breast cancer now so um you know very very happy to discuss anything take any questions um but I know Jacob you've got a um a few points that you'd like to cover oh is he frozen is everyone frozen I think Jacob might have frozen oh no <laughs> <laughs> I've kind of, I've got his uh, I've got his outline of the things that he wanted to to talk about. So why, don't, could, why don't you carry on? That'd be great. I could I'm question oh, myself. <laughs> oh, I think I might be back. Oh, great! <laughs> we can hear you uh, in 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 voice only. Bear with me a uh, uh, second. We love technology, don't we? Yeah. I was uh, so one of the things that Jacob was asking me about was, um, you know do we need to have a you know a stronger voice for um you know for health patient advocacy organizations and and i would say uh, i was thinking about that and um I, I really do think we need to um you know you know it's not it's not an indictment on the work that that everyone does i think it's the system is very much in turmoil i mean you only have to look at how many ministers there are there have been um, how how much churn there is in 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 NHS England and and other other NHS health systems, um, and therefore how difficult how incredibly difficult it is with all that churn going on to to get you know to get our voice heard, and um, so so anything that can be done to to build that kind of collaboration to build the you know the the strength of the message the authenticity of the message um it has got to be it has got to be a good thing but i think it's really really hard at the moment and and then you know combine that with the pressures that everyone 
you know can see in the NHS um we've really noticed how hard it is to partner with the NHS these days and and that's coming from a you know a well resourced um charity so you know it's just really tough so i don't know whether i'm answering your first question well, jake <laughs> I, I think yeah that has sort of uh, picked up on a lot of the themes i think um, mm. one of the things i sense is just I th- people want to listen they get the the the, the power that exists in mm. the listening to users and, and patients and carers but they're just so busy focusing on everything else mm. that, or they don't have the money or the time or the mm. attention the bandwidth to engage any of it so i think it's i i'm so often struck whether because they don't have the bandwidth do you do you lean into trying to be extra helpful to try and support them and be as constructive as you possibly can or do you go the opposite way in you know in a sort of campaigning sense you're like it's not okay to not have the bandwidth do you have to sort of speak Mm. up and be a bit more um uh bold in in the way that we present our messages back into the system to make ourselves heard i don't know if Mm. you have a view on on that tension yeah i i mean i think it is it is a really difficult one because you know that you kind of find yourself thinking well at what point do we just say this is really not good enough um and you know the problem is in so many different ways we could be at that point now we could have been there last year we could have been there 10 years ago depending on which bit of the system you look at so um i suppose my um approach and and what what we're trying to do here is to is to really think about the, the, the medium term, not just the short term, um, and make sure that um, we are being really clear about the the you know so, so for example like talking about the number of um, the number of women who might um, have undiagnosed breast cancer and might die because of the um, shortcomings post pandemic. So you can't not talk about that. Um, but then what we've done is we've uh, you know developed some stats that can articulate that but then come up with um, what we've called a blueprint for the screening program for the future so that it can it can get ready for the future so no one could accuse us of being sensationalist we're offering solutions and ideas but then saying well actually it really isn't good enough um, and so, so that's a bit of a combination of being a bit shouty um, but also trying to be constructive, so it's a fudge to your answer. <laughs> I think that's quite nice though, because it's 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 taking that principle of always of being evidence based in the blueprint mm. that you're you're painting for the system. You're mm. also giving them the the material that helps them move towards prevention mm. and uh, earlier diagnosis. And we know that's an area mm. that the system has to move increasingly towards. Yeah. I, I don't know if you if you wanted to talk a little bit about what you've been doing on, on prevention and screening, just because actually I think that's helpful for members to hear about yeah. the opportunities there. Well, I was, I was really interested to, that you were having the the um, the conversation earlier on about the weight loss drugs, because, uh, whoa, that is a complex area. But so in, in, in cancer and breast cancer particularly, um, in order to reduce the risk of someone developing breast cancer there are you know you can take lots of lifestyle steps you know you can stop drinking you can um you know you can maintain a a healthy body weight and so on you can do all these things but the biggest risk factor is age and sex so um it's you know there's not a lot that lots of people can do about their risks and so what we're concerned about is how do you talk about how do you empower people to to understand and and manage where possible their own risks in such a way as you're not finger wagging you know so if you say you've got to lose weight how do you you know how are people meant to do that if they've been struggling with their weight for years you know where where are the where are the support services what are the clues as to how how behavior change can happen so so we we what we need we need to be really realistic so so we tend to focus most in terms of prevention on the things that people can do practically. And that in breast cancer is a lot about um, encouraging uh, people who are at a very high risk of breast cancer. So that's a small proportion uh, to seek help to if, if you know, 
women from the um, Jewish community are at a very high risk of having the BRCA gene. So are there services in place to support them um, to think about some of the preventative measures that can be taken, like taking anti-estrogens or having surgery? But so so it's, it's, we do have to be in the realm of what is actually possible. Um, but we are doing some work around trying to find new ways of communicating around those lifestyle changes because in a way that isn't isn't finger wagging and isn't really um offensive <laughs> so that we can you're not you know you're not saying to people who have breast cancer you know making them feel like it's their fault so mm -hmm. you've got to it, it's a really difficult one and we don't have the answer to that but screening campaign wise um we've been doing a lot of work with parliamentarians as you know as you would expect but interestingly um, we're, we're thinking about how we can work more with local government, how we can um, and, and thinking about inequalities. And, um, you know, there are real issues in our world around the survival and experience for black women, for women from South Asian communities, women with disabilities. So how, how can we uh, and we're working with the NHS a bit, but not as much as we could um, to provide targeted awareness campaigns for particular communities that are underserved and that for me feels like a really good um and, you know there's there's so much headroom to make a difference mm. there feels like a really good space for us to do to do more and and actually people you know often what people need from us is really good content and uh, the you know and and prioritizing this and then we can provide them with with the kind of the the nudge to get them more active um you know local local authorities that you know they're having such a hard time at the moment to 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 do some awareness raising about breast cancer in their their communities is is a positive thing that they can do and sometimes they really grasp it so yeah it's about being a bit opportunistic as well I think the, the point about local government is a really fascinating one because uh, uh, many moons ago I used to work for the local government association and, and since that time I've also done work you know trying to um, support local government it's a very challenged area there's also an awful lot of councils you know we talk about 42 ICS as being difficult to mm -hmm. engage with when you're talking about 152 or 153 local authorities that yeah deliver, um, adult social care services and public health then even further when you get into district and borough councils, how do you handle the complexity of that and the scale of that as, as a challenge? And I'm just also thinking about the size of our members. So some are very big charities, others are tiny. Mm. Do you have any thoughts about how you go about doing that? Yeah, I think dealing with complexity and coping with ambiguity are they're the they're the really valuable kind of skill sets that that we need in our in our world because we are dealing with you know, with so so many complex issues, whether you're thinking about, you know, um, you know, mental health issues through to, um, you know, simple accessing, um, you know, machines, uh, mammography machines f from someone in a wheelchair, you know, it's like the, you're talking about so many, you know, molecular biology through to, so everyone is um, across so many issues. And so I think there's the only way that we can cope with, um, all all of this is to really nail down um uh, the the priorities for our, our you know our people so is it for our are we representing patients are we representing carers um and and do we know the so how do we get the insight what do they want what do they want from us as a charity what do they want from the nhs and we have to use that as our north star so who 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 are we who are we serving and that, that sounds because there are so many things that you can do all the time and you just have to keep going back to that insight um and you know in in a way smaller organizations are sometimes closer to to that than you know than bigger organizations who have to do you know who have to do the insight have to commission research and so on but sometimes smaller organizations are really close and you know literally sit with um the the, the people that they're advocating for or are the, mm. or they are the people that, that are advocating so so um i think that's the only way we can do it i think i i, I think also people get a bit daunted don't they by the scale of all those different opportunities and different kind of people they should be engaging with and all those different issues i've often found it's like 
push at the doors that are open you know if you've got that yeah. insight, if you're a small organization you you're kind of you can't do everything so don't worry about everything just like take seize the opportunities in front of you and mm. and, and sort of run with those I think that that can help yeah too. I, I just to add to add to that because I think that's really really good advice um the the idea of kind of trying things out you know it's a kind of more of a kind of digital mindset where you test and learn test and learn test and learn and uh, I think that's that's really good to try things out and to learn and and learn and talk about the things that work and sometimes focus on the things that work rather than the things that don't work um because then you know you can build optimism and momentum around that but you know not trying to boil the ocean and um that that's and at the moment you know it is really easy to despair um and and that sometimes i think one of the most valuable things we can do is to offer hope uh and not despairing because um it, you could easily despair at what's happening in our health system and and you know there are lots of things that we actually used to do a lot better and there are lots of ideas that have been deprioritized because you know the, because of the pressures and um li you know, listening i think you're right people want to listen to patients but but it's just it's just too hard and so we've we've got to you know focus on the things that do work and the benefits and and it will it will get better <laughs> we have to hope that so i think picking up on that that point of well despair or hope depending which way you feel about it um should we move on to the general election and just <laughs> the thoughts about i mean how do we go about actually injecting some of that hope that it can be better it can be i mean we're not entering the same world that um uh i mean there's a lot of talk about if labor come in things might improve but the the economy's in a different position you know we don't have the same money floating around the system so actually change any change that does happen regardless of the result of the election could well be very slow so we could be in for a real slog how mm. do we inject hope into that environment and how do we get that message across to politicians in particular well i think we have to get our acts our act together and be really strong as a sector um and and do do some of the work around identifying what are the most important things that that we need and going for those repeat 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 and you know i feel as i as i understand it um the opposition um their their health um team is you know less than you know it's less than 10 people or it's a very small very small um and i i think uh, you know potentially what they'll be trying to do is to say as little as possible before the election so that it doesn't get unpicked and and i think we mustn't give up hope around the the, the possibility of of you know positioning for a new administration um you know some really really ambitious um areas for for development and change that are that can be you know that can be quick wins for for an incoming administration whoever they are um and i know um you know everyone is really worried about resources i'm really worried about resources but not everything that we want to see happen does have to cost the earth there are um you know there are important things about about care and service and quality of experience and and data and understanding what what uh, service users need to see that that don't have to cost the earth but can really you know fuel a, 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 an ever improving service so I'd, I'd i i i wouldn't want to say because there isn't loads of money that we can't get you know really good cultural change and and really you know strong um a direction of travel um in the right way I, sure I, that. I, well, I think there's something interesting in that, in that I've been in, in a few conversations recently where people have been talking about think of policy suggestions, which there might be legislative levers to pull, but rather than things yeah. that are more funding based, because actually a government that has not a lot of money, but still wants to be making a difference mm -hmm. might have to think of other options. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that it picks up on a comment in the chat, actually, mm -hmm. I guess, how much more time do you think we should be spending with NHS uh, policymakers and DHSC officials rather than getting sidetracked by the politics of it actually be working mm. with officials on the really nitty-gritty of making policy yeah. to try and find those cost neutral but big impact yeah. patients do you think that's something we should spend more time on 
Um, I I suppose I, I would just say a couple of things about the uh, major conditions strategy at the moment, which um, yes. is just really um, I think incredibly frustrating for for everyone that we've you know had a potent, you know new minister, new secretary of state coming in right in the middle of that process. I suppose for me we have to as uh, 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 you know that the, the the officials may well be the people that stay around, um, whether they are the fit the officials in the Department of Health. Um, or NHS England and Wales and Scotland and you know Northern Ireland of course too so so building relationships with with key officials is is a is a good thing um but also um that they are going through this incredible uh, restructure in NHS England which again makes that shaky so I think the work that people are doing to to develop strong uh, policy positions in preparation for 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 the major condition strategy if it happens that's really it is worth doing because you know good good ideas are good ideas and and where you've got evidence and insight that support them that is really valuable so that's not going to go away the framework around something like a major condition strategy you know that could change they could have different headings and put things under in different boxes but essentially if 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 uh, you know if the insight and and ideas are there then that you can you know i'm not saying they apply to any government but you you can um, you're you're kind of a bit further ahead um if there is a new administration so yes i would say it is worth um continuing to build those relationships with with the officials yeah thank you i think it's um i mean i see the major condition strategy is a good example of actually if we mm. even if we don't have enough time for that itself to be implemented mm. the work mm. the officials have put in still stays there so how do you build yeah. on that thinking how do you build on the yeah. idea of you know that the, they're doing they're focusing on multiple mm. conditions for example mm. the first time mm. ever they're having a multiple mm. condition look at things and that's a positive to hold on to yeah absolutely and and that that's got to be a good thing i mean going back to what i said at the start you know it's 30 years ago i think that the long term mm. conditions uh, uh, association or whatever we called it uh, came together to say you know people need to understand you know self management information support peer support you know all these things you know you know let's get there i mean um, that is both optimistic that it can happen it can make a difference but also slightly pessimistic about the length of time it takes for for change to serve to flow well one of the obviously one of the big changes though has been how um the clinical community react to this because when i first started back in those back in the day you know the clinical community were really opposed to giving up any authority or any anything to patients so just getting a doctor to give you a let a copy of a letter was revolutionary so so th- you know that the things have changed yeah. you know let's modern, not forget where yeah, we, let's come, not where we forget come from there have been yeah. huge changes you know so the fact that it's you know it's not quite law i think maybe it's law actually that you have to get a cop you know let copies of letters are even though you still don't get them but that that you are entitled to have a copy of your gp record and 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 letter and so on you know that that's that is i mean for the younger people on the call that probably feels really depressing me saying that, but that is really it is progress i promise no, you no it is it is huge progress um we haven't got much time left so i'm going to pick up one try and pick up a question mm-hmm. that pulls a few things together from the chat um icbs they're mm-hmm. a challenge for big and small charities to engage with you mentioned the restructuring mm-hmm. nhs england which is making it even harder i think yeah certainly to land those policy conversations um and there's been a suggestion here about whether a low cost change would be to change legislation to strengthen the requirement to engage between icss and vcscs do you think that would help i mean it it might do. I, I think that it's the behaviours that are the problem, I, I think, in a lot of ways. So how do you change the behaviour of the people who are populating those those organisations so that they understand the value of, of the work that we all do? Um, I, I, I think um, it'd be um, quite, uh, there'd be a lot of resistance to, to moving the deck chairs around uh, in terms of NHS structures and, and doing having a big health bill early on, I think. Um, I'd be quite surprised if if that would be something that a new administration would want to do because you en- you then open up the possibility of all sorts of things um, going on in through Parliament, which could be really difficult to manage. So I, I would I would imagine that, that that wouldn't be something that I could be Not completely sure. wrong, but I, I'd be surprised if that was an early thing to do. 
yeah, I think it's it's probably not top of the list, even though it would yeah. be something that's a common ask. I remember that in going the bill going through the 20, 22 um act, just how mm. many people were trying to secure a seat at the table, as you were talking about earlier. Yeah. Names yeah. Names, um, and the pushback on that um was quite strong. So it feels mm. like I can see the incentives. I wonder if there's probably more in um routes through regulation, say. So like yeah. what CQC, yeah. CQC are doing about their expectation of how an ICS is engaging, that's mm. possibly a more viable route mm. to, to see mm. that. Um, Dilith, we are out of time, but can I say a huge thank you on behalf of me, the National Voices team and all of our other members. It's been fascinating talking to you mm -hmm. and thank you for all of the work you did uh, um, 30 <laughs> years ago because uh, uh, and it's, it's a delight to be able to continue the mission. So, well, thank you. Yeah, it's amazing what you what you do and, and I hope you have a, a lovely rest of the meeting. So good luck, everyone. Take care. Thank Thanks. you. Bye bye. Bye.